Okay, here we are once again with the Natural Science 116 video lecture. Natural Science 116 video lecture 4. And I'll start with some announcements. We have this, the lecture for Thursday, April 2nd. And the homework for this and the notes will be due Tuesday, April 14th because we have the intervening uh, spring break. Okay, so due Tuesday, April 14th. On that same day, Tuesday, April 14th, we'll have the fifth lecture and it will be essentially a review. In fact, I'll try to start that review as a bit of a study guide at the end of this hour because um, we'll be re reviewing for that exam, which will be on that following Thursday, which is in the syllabus. We're trying to hold, we're going to try to maintain that. And uh, good, more about that later. Right, right now we just want to get through this material. The material is heat engines. I showed you a bunch of demonstrations in the big lecture hall the other day. And we ended with a few different heat engines, and I want to go through the theory of that. Really wish I had you here at this point so I could uh, bring these points home. It's a very interesting subject, but it's going to get a little technical. Uh, but I'll give you some interesting stuff to, to look up and maybe get some more printouts, as always. You want to get nice printouts for your book. Okay, so the topic is heat engines. And I'm just going to review what we saw the other day. So the first thing we saw was the Christmas pyramid. So let's say heat engine examples. So the first example is the Christmas pyramid. from Germany. Okay, the Christmas pyramid. And what was that? It had that turbine here on the top, the propeller, and then there was a, a rod here that connected to a platform, and we had the three wise men and some other business going around. And what was drawing it What was driving it was a candle burning here. So, so we had a candle, we had a few candles burning. Okay. This was on a platform, and consequently there was a rotation of the whole thing. And so that was work. This thing was spinning around, and it was work due to the burning of fuel. So we have an updraft here, so we're talking about convection currents. And we know there that energy goes from hot to cold. So we actually have what we're going to call, in all of our cases now, we're going to say we've got that hot temperature here, and we've got that cold temperature up here, relatively cooler temperature. So TH and TC, there's also thermal energy that we're going to label as QH. And when it comes out and keeps going here, it's QC. Again, thermal energy at a higher, thermal energy at a lower temperature. And I should even add that I had put that chimney on there. Remember the chimney barely made it work, but that was very important. The chimney really extends the whole action and puts you between a higher and a lower temperature, puts a real barrier up there between. Okay, so there's the Christmas pyramid. The next example was the steam engine. Yeah, you can get printouts for all of these that will look pretty good. The principle with the steam engine is that you've got some fire down here, fuel slash fire. You've got a boiler with water in it and create steam and you connect that steam via a pipe to a cylinder with a piston inside and then the expanding steam pushes the piston forward 
and because there's a connecting rod here, it actually pushes a wheel and turns the wheel. So you have, in terms of your, the terminology we're going to use here, we have the boiler, we have the cylinder, we have the piston, and the piston is this part right here. This is the connecting rod. Connecting rod. Got a flywheel. And then this thing turns and we were able to hook it up to something and power an electric light. Okay. Flywheel. Okay. Now, of great importance was the fact that there was a valve here. And that valve releases the uh, pressure, and then when this thing makes its return stroke, it pushes the steam out into this direction here. So this is where that QC was, again, that we have up here. We have some high temperature uh, thermal energy coming in here and some lower temperature thermal energy going out the valve. Okay, so those were our two, <coughs> pardon me, our two examples. We've got the Christmas pyramid, we've got the steam engine. And I want to just mention another one that you guys can look up. Okay. And we're, we're going to see it's always the same principles on these things. So this next one that you guys want to look up and get a printout of And that will not be difficult to understand at all. Is a so engine, and then this next example is what's called a solar chimney power plant. Solar chimney power plant. And these are more pilot projects. They've been built, they exist, the principles are clear. Um, we'll say something about their efficiency later on. But the idea is this, you have a big canopy. Let's see how to draw the perspective on that thing. Actually, maybe the kind of a round disc would work better. So this is a roof with opening to the outside. It's just a transparent roof and they stick a giant chimney right in the middle. Okay. And what happens is solar radiation, so I'm just going to write sunlight, heats the air underneath. So there's hot air underneath this thing and that just causes a draft right up the chimney. Okay. And so you just by having sunlight heat the air underneath here, and then you have cool air coming in the side. Cool air coming in the side is heated. You get a giant updraft. And so if you just put a turbine in here, like with our solar, with like with our Christmas pyramid, then the turbine will spin. And you put you stack a few of them. Okay, I'm not going to make any claims for the great efficiency of this thing. It's interesting in principle. It's very interesting um, because it's a solar-driven heat engine. It's a heat engine because you've got high temperature underneath here. So I'm going to write TH that's inside and underneath. There's lower temperature at the top. Okay. There is... that QH, thermal energy at a high temperature going rushing up the chimney when it comes out and it leaves here and enters the atmosphere, it's cooled down. So we're going to see this thing actually has all the ingredients of the heat engine that the other two that were burning something had, although they're not burning anything. So these turbines, instead of being driven by uh, candles and the draft from the candles are driven from the sunlight producing the hot air under here. 
So yeah, it's a solar chimney power plant. You get some nice printouts. There are a few of them in existence, and uh, they're very interesting just from the standpoint of all the processes that we've discussed so far this semester. Okay, that's why we love this thing. Yes, now, so let me write here homework. This as well, so you want to print out an image for this in your book. So this is an object I could actually ask you about on the exam because it just brings everything into play. Sunlight, cool air, warm air, turbine, that's, turbine that spins here, hooked up to a generator and so forth. Okay, so it's actually a pretty transparent object. What I'm going to do next is draw a schematic diagram that um, covers all of these heat engines. Okay, I have an abstract schematic diagram, and uh, once you look around, you'll see this things in all the books too, and, you know, everywhere. But I'm going to explain it here. Use it to explain all of these heat engines. I should mention also, so we now have the Christmas pyramid, the old-fashioned steam engine, the solar chimney, the engine in your car, of course, is also a heat engine. So don't forget that. It's, a, it's an internal combustion engine. You can look into that as well. Okay. So many types of heat engines. At this time in history, they're still driving our whole civilization. Right? Most of our power is generated using heat engines of some kind. So very, very important. Okay, so next is the schematic diagram of the process. And here's how it goes. I'm just going to draw these boxes first and some arrows and then I'll label them and explain them. So this is the story. We have up here what's called a high temperature reservoir. High temperature reservoir. That just represents the source of all of this thermal energy that's coming out at a certain high temperature. When we analyze this thing, we're going to pretend or, or assume that the whole thing is, is uh, isolated. So all the ingredients have to be here. The high temperature reservoir is where the heat comes from, and it will deliver a quantum of thermal energy, which we always use Q, at the high temperature. Okay? It delivers it to the engine. And what does the engine do? It kicks out some work. Remember, that was the whole plan of the heat engine, to get work from thermal energy. So it kicks out some work, but we saw in all of our examples there has to be exhaust. Okay, the steam engine obviously had exhaust. The Christmas pyramid had that chimney and was all manner of Heat was going up through the chimney, so that was exhaust. Um, automobile has an exhaust pipe. So you're always going, by the way, if you feel the exhaust coming out of the tailpipe of an automobile, it's hot. Okay, it's warm. But it's not nearly as warm as the combustion uh, gases. So that is QC, that's the energy flowing out of, we'll call it the exhaust, of the engine. It's also referred to as waste heat. And then it is taken up by the low temperature reservoir. And the low temperature reservoir, we could say it's the atmosphere, it's the surrounding atmosphere. Okay, so that's the schematic that covers all heat engines. And, you know, I should have put it up earlier, I had it on the board last time. So, heat engines. Um, from thermal energy, I'll just raise, from heat obtained work. Right, so we have 
have q, and we want to get some w out of u. Good. <clears throat> Okay. Now the question is how much work is there to be had? And the answer to that is so how much work? Well we know that the, that the mechanical equivalent of heat, say if we had one calories worth of heat, something to raise the temperature of a uh, liter of water by one degree Celsius, then that would, strictly speaking, represent 4,186 joules. But we already see we can't get all of those, because we do the combustion, we get the work from our steam engine, but there's exhaust, and that exhaust is also some of the heat, the waste heat. So this is, um, this is the limit this would be the maximum possible is the maximum or is the amount that is available. You see, this is why I like to retain the calorie as a unit because we use it to represent combustion and thermal energy and then we can ask, well, how many joules can we get out of that or with the joules we're representing work. Okay. So it's the amount that is available But by no means can we get this much. And the question of how much can be extracted is the highly interesting point that we're going to cover next. How much of that energy can we actually get uh, and put to use? We actually put to use. So suppose you put so and so many calories worth of uh, gasoline in your car, how much work can the car engine do? That's the question that's being asked, asked here. All right, so I have to keep that picture up for the rest of the time. We'll work on this half of the board. I'm going to next introduce the concept of efficiency. That's about what we've been asking right there, is we've been asking about the efficiency. So I will define efficiency and we'll continue on that way. efficiency that's supposed to define what we've been asking for, how much work for how much fuel. And the definition is going to be equal to the work that we obtained divided by the thermal energy that went in, right? This represents all the thermal energy that went into the engine. And this number is always going to be less than or equal to one that would, because if it were greater than one, that would violate conservation of energy. So we know that can't happen. So it's a number that's less than or equal to one. And uh, we can also write it as percent, and the maximum percentage would be 100%. Okay. So there's our definition of efficiency. For example, if you, got, if you put in 1,000 joules and got out 500, then you would have an efficiency of 500 over 1,000, or one half, or 50%. Good. So that's the efficiency concept. So the next thing we have to do as we go into this analysis is talk about the ideal engine. So we're going to idealize this engine and say that it has no friction. Okay. It has no waste. It doesn't. If you put your hand on the engine, you wouldn't even feel any heat because the only heat that's going to come out of that is going to be out of the exhaust. So it's a, it's a perfectly ideal engine. So I'll just write here, no friction, comma, no other losses. <clears throat> yeah. So there's our idealization. And under those circumstances, we have energy conservation, which will tell us that from energy conservation, uh, 
energy is neither created nor destroyed, we'll be able to say, okay, then the QH that goes in is equal to exactly the work plus the QC that went out the exhaust. That would be energy conservation. Put in energy as heat, got some work, got some exhaust, and that was a balance. Okay. You know, maybe I'll erase here and make up a little more room on this board. We'll shove this picture to the left. Got some unused space here on the left. Okay, I do need this picture at all times. You have to get used to or kind of memorize it. And so we've got high temperature reservoir, high temperature heat, we've got the engine that kicks out some work, we've got the exhaust and the waste heat to the low temperature reservoir. There we go, ideal entry. Here, this sequestered on the side there. Okay, so with this efficiency definition and the ideal engine, we can now write the ideal efficiency. And that is W over QH. But now look, this W can be written as QH minus QC. I'll just subtract QC over. So it's QH minus QC over QH. And that simplifies QH over QH is 1 minus QC over QH. So this is the ideal efficiency. And it makes as much sense as before. Namely, if you didn't have any exhaust whatsoever, you could call that zero and you'd have an efficiency of one. But because there's always some exhaust, some waste heat, you're always going to have one minus something. So the efficiency is going to be less than one, less than 100%. Okay. That's the ideal efficiency. Now the next stage of this analysis, we already used the first law of, cons of uh, thermodynamics. I'll write your first law. Now we're going to use the second law. Second law of thermodynamics. And that says that the total entropy, or the entropy of a closed system, always increases. I'll write this down. Second law was delta S total greater than or equal to zero for a closed system. I might say, well, that heat engine is not a closed system. Uh, right? It was just a little thing on the table that had all the atmosphere around it. However, in our schematic, we've included everything. We've included, you could say we've included the environment in the sense that we said we've got the high and low temperature reservoirs included into there. So we're gonna do this delta S total expression and apply it to this right here. So we had that in our notes last time or was it the lecture before? So I guess I should remind us a bit about that entropy expression. We had delta S is equal to Q over T, where T is measured in Kelvin. And we said if the Q is leaving something, we're going to have a negative. If the Q is entering something, we're going to have a positive sign. That was that time, and I had shown you that the delta S total greater than or equal to zero was um, equivalent to heat flowing from high to low temperature. It was that fundamental. So that's when I, when, why when I apply this thing, the result is going to be very fundamental. Right? No arguments. Okay. So for our heat engine. Ideal engine, we're going to have this delta S total is going to equal, we're going to have minus QH over TH. That represents 
this phase of the process, okay, energy leaving pH into the engine, and these are just magnitudes. Um, I'm going to write plus zero. I'm writing plus zero because this engine's ideal, it has no friction, there's no entropy change associated with the energy itself because it's so perfect, okay, so ideal. On the other hand, the exhaust phase, the waste heat is going to be plus room here, or either plus sign plus QC over TC, again in Kelvin. So that is the total change in entropy, and what we know about it is that this is greater than or equal to zero because energy flows from hot to cold. So from this expression, I get a couple of I get an inequality. I get QC over TC, I'll just bring this to the right side, is greater than or equal to QH over TH. Or I can cross multiply here and say QC over QH is greater than or equal to TC over TH. So there's a result, you know, you can you can actually stop the video and make sure you see these things. Okay. This is the result I'm going to use. Since the ratio of those heats is greater than or equal to the ratio of the corresponding temperatures. Okay. Right? This would be joule over joule, but it's dimensionless, this would be Kelvin over Kelvin dimensionless. Okay. So we can use that. Okay, I need this here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, yeah, we have that. I'm going to erase this. So now I'm going to evaluate this equation here, star, this expression. So what we have is E ideal, which is equal to 1 minus QC over QH. Because QC over Q, uh, because QC over QH is greater than or equal to TC over TH, this expression is less than one minus TC divided by TH. Okay, if this is the big result, drum roll, whatever. That's the big result that I'm going to explain now. So this inequality here. And uh, if you play around with these inequalities, you can make it as clear to yourself as you want, right? Because this one's larger, when I subtract it off, then I get an inequality when this is less than this right here. And what that means is the ideal efficiency is less than or equal to this expression on the right here. I'm going to write that down, and then we're going to work with this a bit. So the ideal, which is the really the maximum possible efficiency of a heat engine, is always less than or equal to 1 minus this ratio of temperatures. And we, again, these temperatures in Kelvin. Okay, so we're going to figure out what these efficiencies can be. Got my picture up here that we'll keep referring to. Good, the ideal efficiency is less than, clearly it's less than one, but it's less than this expression here. And what it means is it only depends on the, the te temperatures that your engine is running at. Okay. Independent of the design or anything, depend, it just depends on these temperatures that it's running between. So I'm going to define something called the Carnot efficiency. And Carnot was the, an engineer, French engineer, who figured this stuff out. Carnot efficiency. 
So the Carnot efficiency E sub C is just this expression with the, without the inequality. One minus T C divided by T H. Same thing for Kelvin. I'll calculate a couple of examples to bring the point home. Right now that seems very abstract. One thing you can see actually though, the, to get closer to one, to get closer to 100%, you have to run your engine hotter and hotter. The, hot, the higher you make this denominator, the bigger you make this denominator, the less this ratio will be. TC is very difficult to make small. Okay, you've got the atmosphere, and you know that's as warm as it is. Okay, so you already see that high combustion temperatures are important. And in fact, you could say, well, maybe I heard that diesel engines are kind of efficient, and it turns out that they work under higher pressure, compression, and they have higher combustion temperatures. So that fits together, okay, if you've heard about diesel engines. Okay, so next we're going to do a couple of numerical examples. Keeping this schematic here the whole time. just to make our point. So the first example I'm going to use is, suppose we have a heat engine that operates between boiling temperature, boiling water, and room temperature. Okay, those would be your high and low temperatures. So heat engine where TH is equal to 100 degrees Celsius, TC is equal to 20 degrees Celsius. So that's boiling at room temperature. You know, you can imagine that because you have a steam engine, 100 degrees in the boiler and 20 degrees in the room. That steam engine I showed you the other day you know, was some approximation to that. So how efficient can that be? First of all, you have to convert to Kelvin, and you know you're just going to add 273, right? So 100 degrees Celsius is 373 Kelvin. And likewise here, 20 plus 273 is 293. So that's crucial. You can only use this expression if you have the temperature in Kelvin. Yeah, now we're going to plug those in. And uh, we'll use that expression right there. The Carnot efficiency is now going to be 1 minus 293 divided by 373. We can get rid of the units because it's dimensionless at this point. And if you rationalize this thing, you'll have the difference was 80 and the denominator is 373. And the answer to this is going to be something like 0.21, 21%. So I gotta drive the point home here. We have 21%. Are we disappointed that our nice steam engine is only gonna deliver 21% of that thermal energy as work? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Now this expression, waste heat, um, is not the same as wasteful heat, okay? There's no wastefulness involved, it's a, it's a law of nature that that much heat has to, you know, go out to the environment if you're running engines between these two temperatures. So in that sense, it's, you know, waste heat doesn't mean there's any wastefulness involved, but nonetheless, 80% of the energy that could have somehow been available for work, available for work is gone to the environment. It can't, it's not converted to work. So yeah, if you wanted higher efficiencies, you would have to raise these combustion temperatures. And that is in fact what's done. But even the most modern, highly efficient heat engine is not going to get over 50% efficiency. 50% would be considered enormously good, in fact. Um, so this example with this, you know, the example is good because it's boiling water to room temperature. And you're not going to get your TC lower than this practically. In fact, it'll tend to be higher. And uh, you're going to have to work on the high temperature side. 
to improve efficiencies. Okay, okay, why is this so thrilling? You know, well, it's a fundamental constraint on these um, heat engines. It's really a fundamental constraint based on the fact that energy flows from hot to cold. In other words, this cannot be violated. If an engineer comes to you with a scheme to have a higher efficiency than the Carnot efficiency, um, you know, you throw them out, so to speak. It's not going to work. It's like trying to, it's just as much, you know, as impossible as trying to violate energy conservation is trying to violate this Carnot efficiency. On the other hand, um, people work with it, right? They work with it and they actually try to achieve it. So if you have these two temperatures, then your goal is to get as close to this as possible, okay? Not to violate it, to get as close to that as possible. Okay, so that's the Carnot efficiency. And uh, the great lesson is that just from you know, the second law of thermodynamics, from the most laws of thermodynamics, we put these very fixed constraints on what is possible. And since we're running our whole civilization on heat engines, or for the most part we are, this is a very, very important expression. Um, what I'd like to talk about sometimes, this could come on the final, but we'll bring it up now, is you could use this to try to estimate the maximum efficiency of the solar chimney power plant. Okay. The solar chimney power plant, um, I'll draw it up here again. So you've got the canopy on the bottom, Right, the sunlight's coming into here, some openings to the side, and then this tremendous chimney here. And the little reflection shows that the efficiencies are going to be very low because it's always being fed with cooler air from the surroundings, being heated up underneath. The temperature difference between the air underneath here and the air coming out can't be that great. So your TC and your TH are very close together. You're not going to get many, um, uh, much efficiency out of this. If you were researching this, for example, suppose we had been writing those papers, and unfortunately we're not writing. If you've been writing a paper and you said, well, I want to talk about solar chimney, then uh, it would have been interesting to dig around and see what the experts are saying about the potential efficiency. Because you could have a word or two with that, you know, they may have all kinds of great plans, especially since there have been plans to build giant ones like this in Australia, turn into a tourist attraction and stuff. Efficiency would have been low, okay. even though it's such a nice uh, example of all of our concepts so far. And you know, the solar energy, which I had hoped to talk about this semester, would have been dealt with right here as well. It was a good place to talk about it. Yeah, we'll see. Our remaining lectures, you know, after spring break, we have the review, then we have the exam, and then we have about five more after that. So we'll see how far we get. I, well, I had ambitions to do a lot of electricity and magnetism. We'll do some, but hopefully we can actually get into the solar energy as well. Definitely a hot topic. Um, okay, what I'm going to wrap it up with today is a bit of a study guide. A bit of a study guide already going into the spring break just to see what awaits us on the final and then of course we'll talk at length about it on the day, but on the, in the week of the, not the final, sorry, the midterm exam. Study guide for the midterm exam, we'll talk about it again after spring break. So let me get a little list going up here of what all is important. And then we'll wrap things up with that. Okay, there will be no major surprises there, that's for sure. So for the exam. The first topic on the exam is the last topic on the first exam which was we, you know, we ended up with work 
over all rays and check all rays, your force, work, power, conservation of energy. I'm just going to write energy here, of course, conservation of energy. Then we have the major topic, hydropower. So the whole hydropower topic, that, remember I said that was a, in a sense a centerpiece of the whole semester. It was the middle of the semester, a centerpiece because it was so rich. Remember the major, the, the whole cartoon that we had that encompassed everything. We had solar energy, we had a lot of things. So the hydropower is a major topic. Then we got into thermal physics. And for thermal physics, I'm just going to write uh, thermometers or let's write temperature scales. Or in fact, let's just write temperature, heat, calorie, and, uh, and mechanical equivalent of heat. Mechanical equivalent of heat. That's very important. Remember that? I just used it in today's lecture. Calorie 40, uh, 186 joules, right? Yeah, so that'll be that topic. And then um, we had some things about heat transfer. And we had some things here. I'm going to write five right here and leave myself a little space at the bottom. Um, phases of matter. States of matter, phase transitions, and that stuff deserve some mention. And then heat engines. So I demonstrated last time what I talked about today, heat engines. Heat engines and their efficiency. Okay, so that's in, in broad outline what we're going to be dealing with at most. I can, don't have to put everything on there, but you know, each one will try to write a half a page on or so before you know we've got a we have, we've got a lot of work done. And yeah, we're just also just following the whole logic of what we did. Remember the hydropower just followed right out of its force and power and energy discussions. Temperature, we started out something new, but then we made contact with the whole energy uh, concepts from above here, which are manifested in this expression, right? This one here, one calorie, 4,186 joules. So what you'll find is you can keep all of your thoughts together with just a couple of these labeled cartoons and this order, this order of discussion. Okay, we're going to call it a day. So take good notes, send them to me when you have them. Um, and of course, enjoy your spring break. See you next time.